we have one more small part of the atom size conversation to discuss. And it also tags in here with the other two discussions which have to do with ions. So let's start by thinking about the kinds of ions that we are going to form. So we initially we were talking about sodium ions and chloride ions just as an example and, uh, and their electron configurations, right? So obviously with sodium ion we have an atom that is losing an electron. So if we were writing that as an oxidation reaction, that's how we would write it. And the same thing is too with chlorine. Chlorine is gaining an electron to become a chloride ion. So we can have a conversation about what the effect is on the atom size for both of these two factors. So let's take a look at sodium here. Sodium we know has an electron configuration with a neon core and then 3s1 for its uh, valence electron. So if it loses that electron, we know that this is the one that's going to go away. So sodium ion has the neon electron configuration, but if we think about the size of the neon atom versus the size of the sodium ion, Neon has 10 protons and 10 electrons. Sodium has 11 protons and 10 electrons. So they both have their electrons 1s2, 2s2, 2p6 with this full neon electron configuration. But the difference is that with neon, we have one fewer proton. So what do you think that's going to do to the size of the atom? What is that going to do to where the 2p6 electrons and those 2s2 electrons are in sodium compared to in neon? If you're guessing that when you have 11 protons, your atom is going to be a little bit smaller then if you have 10 protons, you are absolutely right. Excuse me, not your atom, but your ion. Sodium ion is smaller than neon because it has a larger atomic charge. It has more protons, and so it attracts its electrons in a little more closely. So let's go and take a look at that graph again. Only this time, we're going to look at atom size and compare it to the ion size after the fact. So we were just looking at sodium ion and what, or excuse me, sodium atom and what happens when we compare it to sodium ion and as you can see it has gotten lots smaller. It has lost that outer shell and it has more protons than neon does and so it's quite a bit smaller. You can see this trend with all of the cations on this list. And this will be true for any cation. Cations will always be smaller than their neutral companion atom. So now, of course, your eyes are probably straying over here to these anions. So let's take a look at them. With anions, we're adding extra electrons, but we have the same number of protons. So even though oxygen and fluorine also both have neon electron configurations, the oxygen has two fewer protons compared to neon, and fluorine has one fewer proton compared to neon. So these two will both be larger than neon, and quite a bit larger. Let's go back to that other graph, and we'll see how much larger. So go ahead and take a look at these numbers. Sodium ion is 102 picometers. Oxygen, or excuse me, oxide ion is 140, and fluoride ion is 133. All right, here's those neutral atoms again. Neon is 69 picometers. So remember, sodium ion was 102. That was larger than neon because it has, hold on, is that what I said? Just a minute, I'll come back to it. Uh, anyway, we'll deal with oxygen and fluorine first. So sodium was 102 according to this um, previous chart. And these ones were what, 140 and 133, I think? So you can see that the O2 minus and the uh, 
F minus are both a lot bigger than neon. Okay, so I actually just looked up uh, the details on why sodium ion is reported as having a larger uh, ionic radius compared to the neon, and that's because they're measured differently. So that's our short answer. So I'll go ahead and revise my little drawing here. So we'll fix this right here. So at least according to the way that these are measured, I guess I better fix my drawing and maybe I better just care, compare apples to apples. All right, so we will instead compare sodium ion to oxide ion and to fluoride ion since the reason why these are measured differently is that sodium ion, oxide ion, and fluoride ion are all measured when they are in a bond. Sodium, or excuse me, neon doesn't bond to anybody, and so we can't really compare the size of the neon to um, the size of these ions since they are in compounds. All right, so let's go ahead and compare these two because all of them have a neon noble gas electron configuration. So now we are comparing apples to apples here. So this one though has 11 protons, this one has 9 protons, and this one has 8 protons. And so the uh, ionic radii that we had there, now I better go check, were 102 picometers, 140 picometers, and 133 picometers. So these numbers now make a lot of sense, right? And I did promise that I would remind you what a picometer is. It's 1 times 10 to the minus 12 meters. So it's even smaller than a nanometer. A thousand times smaller, or a, a factor of a thousand smaller. All right, so if we look at these three, now that we can compare them, sodium has the most protons, and so it's pulling its 2s and 2p electrons in more strongly than here in oxygen, which only has 8 protons. And fluorine, or fluoride, that looks about the same size. I'll try and do better. All right, fluoride is just a little bit smaller than oxide because it's also, it only has nine protons. It's only a little bit better um, in terms of protons than oxygen. So the size of our ions is going to be affected by the, by the nuclear charge and by the effective nuclear charge. But we have to be comparing similar materials, things that are actually in compounds, things that are either neutral atoms or um, that can make bonds or that are um, ions and everything needs to be isoelectronic in order for us to be able to compare them. And by isoelectronic I mean they all have to have the same electron configuration. They need the same number of electrons. Okay, so now that we're well into talking about ions, we need to talk about forming ions. Well, we need to talk about it a little bit more because we just did talk about it. So we have two different processes here, right? And previously we've called these oxidation and reduction, and those are still perfectly fine things. Um, but in terms of our, our uh, periodic trends, we're going to talk about ionization, and that specifically is going to be oxidation, so removing an electron one at a time. And we can do it either from an atom that's neutral or an ion. So you can remove one electron or you can move, remove multiple electrons, but you have to do them one at a time. So this is called the ionization energy. How much energy does it take to take away an electron? And this is one of our other periodic trends. So if we think about the periodic trend of atomic size, let's go back to that image, 
it turns out that ionization energy tracks pretty well with the atomic radius, except in reverse. The atoms where it's easiest to take away the electron are the largest atoms, because those electrons that are pretty far away from the nucleus are more shielded from the atomic, from the nuclear charge. They're more shielded from the nucleus, and so they're going to be easier to take away than in a really small atom, even if it has fewer protons, because those electrons are closer in to the nucleus. So let's go back and write that down. Low ionization energy is in the largest atoms, neutral atoms. So our trend is that ionization energy decreases going down a group, down a column, and increases across a row. So it's reverse from the atomic uh, radius. This specifically has to do with the first ionization energy, which is to um, remove one, so this is my first ionization energy, remove one electron from a neutral atom. So that would be going from magnesium to magnesium plus, or going from carbon to carbon plus. There is a first ionization energy that is associated with each of these. So if you just wanted to make a guess, which one of these would be larger? Let's go back and look at our atomic size. Here's magnesium. Here's carbon. So jot down your guess, and then let's take a look at the numbers. If you guessed that carbon would have the higher ionization energy, you are correct. The first ionization energy for carbon, so that's to go from neutral carbon atom to carbon plus one, would be 1,086 kilojoules per mole. And for magnesium, it would be 737 kilojoules per mole. So we can see that carbon is smaller. Even though it has fewer protons, it still is harder to take away that electron that first electron than it is in magnesium. So now let's look at some other comparisons. I said that if we go down a group, then our ionization energy decreases. So let's look at lithium. Our first ionization energy, just let me be consistent here. Lithium going to lithium plus one is 520 kilojoules per mole compared to sodium. That ionization energy is 496 kilojoules per mole. It's not a lot smaller but it is a bit smaller as we go down the row, or excuse me, down the group. So this is our second, second periodic trend that generally speaking, ionization energies increase across a row and decrease down a group. I guess I need to go up like that and then down like that. Now both ionization energy and its companion energy type, which is um, electron affinity, are not as trendy. They don't have as, as strong of a correlation in trend as the atomic size does. So let's talk a little bit more about our ionization energies before we move on here. Because what I wanna do is to connect with what we observe in terms of the ions that form.
right? We see sodium ions, Na+. Do we ever see Na2+, uh-uh, we sure don't. So why is that? Let's take a look. This was our first ionization energy to remove one electron from a neutral sodium atom. So what if we wanna take a second electron away from the sodium? You can find tables of ionization energies and what you will find is that if it takes 496 kilojoules per mole to take away that first electron, it takes 4,563 kilojoules per mole to take away the second one. And if you want to take away another one, it costs even more. 6,913 kilojoules per mole. So do we ever see sodium 2 plus and sodium 3 plus? We do not. They cost too much energy. And so, you know, you could do it if you really, really wanted to, but you'd have to put in so much energy that this is not a natural state. So this is not found in nature. So let's think about other things we do find. We find magnesium 2 plus. What about magnesium 3 plus? Well, this also would be the third ionization energy. And you will find that this costs even more than making sodium three plus. So no, this does not happen. The ions that form generally form because they are not too energetically spendy. So here's where I want to make sure that you understand that all ionization costs energy. Anytime we go from a neutral atom to a, an oxidized version of that atom, it will require that we put energy in. But sometimes we get enough energy back from the compound that we form that it makes it worthwhile. So let's talk about getting energy back. The flip side of ionization is called electron affinity. It's sort of a weird name because affinity sounds like just sort of a, I don't know, a tendency toward something that you like. And I'm not sure that that makes a whole lot of sense for an atom, but that's okay. We can get it. So electron affinity is the amount of energy to take a neutral atom and give it an extra electron. So this is us reducing a neutral atom and making it a minus one a charged ion. Okay. So when we look at these energies, let's go find our little table. This is, this is, six, uh, this is figure 7.40 from our book. And what we're looking at here are electron affinity energies in kilojoules per mole. So just like we've discussed with energies before, if the energy is negative, that means we're releasing energy. If the energy is positive, that means we have to put in energy and make in order to make it happen. So let's take a look at some of these atoms that we know form uh, form anions, right? Fluoride, chloride, bromide, iodide, all of these for sure we know 
form anions. And you can see that we release energy when we make anions out of most of the elements on this table. Now what's a surprise is that we also have some amount of energy that's released when we make an anion with these um, group one elements. Do we ever see these as anions? I don't think I've ever seen them as anions. Um, so even though energy is released, that doesn't necessarily mean that's a normal state for this uh, material in nature. So let's take a look at what's going on right here. Notice that it takes energy for us to add another electron to a beryllium and a magnesium. Uh, so let's go ahead and take a look at that in a minute. It also would take a, a, a decent amount of energy for us to add another electron to any of these noble gases. So let's think about why this might be. Let's go back to our picture of what's going on with our atoms. Okay, so let's look at fluorine. With fluorine, its electron configuration is almost neon, right? It's helium 2s2 2p5. So we go. Here's our two P's. We have one extra spot for an electron in the two P. And we know that if we go to the neon electron configuration, that has some extra stability that works out there. So when we go from F to F minus, we go to a neon electron configuration because we add one electron into this 2p spot. And this releases energy. But let's think about neon. Neon already has a full 2p6. I'm going to write it in its somewhat expanded form. So it's 2s2, 2p6 for its electron configuration. So if I wanted to add an electron and make it neon minus, this looks very funny then we would have to add another orbital to put the electron in. And this costs a lot of energy. It costs energy because this 3s uh, orbital is quite a bit higher in energy compared to, to the 2p shell. This is another reason why that sodium ion, uh, atom gets so much larger than the neon atom is, because we have to put an electron quite a ways further out from the nucleus. So this costs energy and it doesn't happen. Again, you probably could make it happen, but this is not going to be a natural state. Sodium, on the other hand, we said was neon 3s1, right? So if we went to sodium minus, it would be neon 3s2. Again, this is not something that we're going to observe. This releases a little energy. But generally speaking, the sodium doesn't really want the electron or at least it wants it less than other things do. And if I say want, I know that's a human emotion, so bear with me. Sometimes I anthropomorphize the element a little bit. But I think you get the feeling here that if sodium is in a, a compound with chlorine, it's much more likely for the chloride to get that extra electron than for the sodium to just hold on to it or to take one from chlorine because it costs more energy to ionize the chlorine than for the sodium to go to sodium plus. And at the same time, going from chlorine to chloride minus, I guess we need the electron over here, right? Releases more energy. than if we were going from the sodium 
to a sodium, uh, <laughs> I can't even say this, <laughs> a sodium anion. <laughs> so since it both costs more energy to ionize the chloride and it releases more energy to make a chloride ion, this is only going to be sodium plus and chloride minus all over the place. It's never ever going to be sodium and Cl plus. Never. Okay. So that silliness aside, the useful thing about ionization energy and electron affinity is that this gives us a reasonable understanding for why some ions don't happen. We can usually find an energetic reason to come up with why some ions don't happen. To me, this is even more important than conversations about the periodic trend. Because if you look at magnesium, we have magnesium forming magnesium 2 plus because it is going to a noble gas configuration. We are not making magnesium minus because, again, just like with neon having to make uh, pick up another orbital, we would have to break into the 3p1 orbital here. And this is too energetically costly. So again, this does not happen. What I want you to take away from this part of the section are our major trends for ionization. That ionization energy decreases down a row, or excuse me, down a column, and increases across a row. And for electron affinity, the nonmetals usually release energy when they form anions. So those are the two big takeaways that I want you um, to come up with. And if you get some additional insights and justification into why certain anions don't form or certain cations don't form by looking at the ionization energy and the electron affinity, that is an extra bonus.